In this video, we're going to discuss the paraxial wave equation, which is basically an approximation to the Helmholtz equation in a certain situation. And that situation is where most of the action, most of the, the optical field is propagating along a certain optical axis, Z. And that is, for example, the case when you're working with the lens systems. We have many lenses here. They're all arranged along a certain optical axis. Uh, and then you assume that the light mostly propagates along this axis and does not really go uh, goes away in very big angles. So um, that's the etymology behind the name paraxial wave equation. Everything happens along a certain optical axis. Now, in order to uh, identify what the Helmholtz equation looks like in this uh, approximation, uh, we're going to use the so-called slowly varying envelope uh, approach. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to say that our field, scalar field, which in general looks like this, we're going to say that our field basically consists of two factors. On the one hand, we have this thing over here, exponential minus j k z, which you know is a, is a plane wave, right? So that's a plane wave along the, the z direction. And that basically expresses the fact that this plane wave here uh, expresses the fact that light is in essence propagating along the z-direction, along our optical axis. But we're going to introduce a little bit more freedom. We're going to say that, okay, this is uh, in essence a plane wave, but it gets modulated by a certain envelope, this amplitude A here, which can vary as a function of R. But we're going to say that this thing varies slowly as a function of Z because all of the fast variation is taken care of by this, this plane wave here. Uh, and this thing here should in essence be a plane wave, but with some small variation as a function of uh, Z here. So this is what we're going to use as an ansatz to plug into the Helmholtz equation. And then we also need a way to figure out how to mathematically describe that this A here, this envelope, very slowly as a function of Z. But for starters, I suggest you pause the video and try to calculate the second order derivative of psi with respect to z so that we can plug this into the Helmholtz equation. Let's take the first order derivative uh, to start with. So we have d psi dz. So it's a factor, uh, so, uh, so it's a product of two factors. So we first do the a dz and then we keep our exponential and then we have a and then we take the derivative of the exponential picking up a factor minus j k okay that's pretty easy but obviously what we need is the second order derivative d psi dz squared so first taking the derivative of d a dz that becomes d to a dz squared exponential minus j k z and uh, then we keep the a d z we keep this guy and take derivative of that guy giving us minus j k exponential minus j k z right so this is the first term taken care of let's now look at the second term so for the second term, taking the derivative of the first factor will give us dA dz minus jk, jk exponential. So that's exactly the same term as we've just written down. And I have some space here to put a factor 2 here. Um, so that's this guy taken care of. And then finally, for the fourth contribution, we need to take the derivative of this thing, picking up another factor minus uh, jk. So this is going to give us uh, minus a k squared exponential minus j k z. Okay, so this is the uh, second order derivative with respect to z. And remember what we're after is the Helmholtz equation. So that's the, 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 the Laplacian of psi plus k squared psi equal to zero. So now we basically have... Um, everything related to the second order derivative with respect to z. Uh, but so far what we've done is fully exact, right? We haven't really made any approximation whatsoever. 
So now is a good time to try and figure out what it really means mathematically that this function a is varying slowly as a function of z. So pause the video and try to think how you would express the fact that a does not vary a lot as a function of z. When we're talking of variations, that basically suggests looking at the derivative, right? So we have dA dz, which expresses the variation of a with respect to z. And this thing should be a small number. So the first thing you might write down is saying that this is a small number, like so, is much, much smaller than, than 1. That's a very good first start, but remember that solutions to the Helmholtz equation and to Maxwell's equation in general, if you multiply them with a certain prefactor, with a certain scaling factor, they will still obey the solution, right? They will still obey the equation. Um, so if you take, for example, A and you multiply it by 10 billion, um, you will still have basically the same solution, physically speaking, uh, but it will no longer satisfy this inequality here. It would be good to also have something that relates to a on the right hand side so to at least solve the problem that these functions a they're only defined up to a scaling factor so you might say let's do something better here and let's compare that to a so now at least if you multiply a by a constant this inequality here doesn't change so that's that's good news the bad news is that this thing doesn't make any sense whatsoever. If you look at the dimensions, this has the dimension of A divided by meters, and this has the dimension of A. So from a dimensional point of view, this is basically nonsense. In order to fix this, we would need to look at the right-hand side, and also here divide by something that has the dimension of meters. Now, what is a good yardstick that we could use in this particular situation? something that has a dimension of length. Well, if you just think about this for a while, the, the wavelength, that's a good suggestion, right? Because that has a dimension of meters and is intimately related to the problem that, that we're trying to solve. So this makes a lot more sense. And then we can also write that this is proportional to uh, k rather than one over lambda a, so that we have something like, uh, like this. Since we have k's appearing here, it makes more sense to write it like, uh, like this. So here we have a very good expression of the fact that we have a slowly varying envelope. The derivative is much smaller than k times a. You could say, let's go back to what we've written down here. And then here we have a small derivative. So this thing we put equal to zero. The second order derivative is that will then also be zero. Uh, but what we then have is minus a k squared, this guy. And if you then add that term, which we need to add anyhow because it's present in the Helmholtz equation, uh, then this thing will completely cancel. And there will no more be any z dependence in the Helmholtz equation at all. And that's obviously too coarse of an approximation. So we don't want to do that. That doesn't give us any, uh, any insight, any information. So if we don't want to neglect the first order derivative, how about neglecting the second order derivative? How about taking this expression here and can we take the derivative of that expression one more time with respect to z and write down something like this, for example? Because if we're able to write down something like this, if you look at the terms that we have, then we would neglect the second order derivative over here with respect to k times the first order derivative. And that's exactly what we have here. The question is, can we do that? Can we have an inequality? take the derivative and then still have an inequality. In general, obviously we can't. If we have, uh, for example, a function here, which is much smaller than another function. Um, so this function is rapidly varying. This function is slowly varying, even though the fact that this function is below that function, after taking the derivative, this one will be much bigger than, than that one. In general, we really cannot not do that. But however, here we don't have two independent functions, f and, and g. We basically have functions which are related by a derivative, right? And moreover, this function a is an extremely boring, slowly varying function. So if it's such a boring function, that means that the derivative is smaller, small. And if you take more and more derivatives, the contributions will become smaller and smaller and smaller. So 
in our case, simply because A is such a boring function, and that's exactly the crux of the slowly varying envelope approximation, it's okay to write down uh, something like this. Right, so this was a pretty long-winded explanation about what terms to neglect in these equations. Now that we know what to do, pause the video and implement all of these changes and then finally derive the actual Helmholtz equation. So here we have our original Helmholtz equation. Uh, we have the Laplacian here, consists of three terms, uh, derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. So first we have d to psi dx squared, d to psi dy squared. And then for the d to psi dz squared, we have uh, this thing over here. So we're going to neglect uh, this by virtue of the slowly varying envelope approximation. And then we have a second term. And then for the third term, minus a k squared, this guy, well, this will vanish because we also need to add this particular term to the Helmholtz equation. And then the whole thing equal to zero. What we need to do is just add that term and then we have our, uh, our equation. So here we're adding, uh, that becomes minus, we're adding minus to j derivative of a with respect to z exponential minus j kz equal to zero. And then if you just remember that psi is basically the product of a and the exponential, then we can drop the exponential everywhere. And then we can also use the notation of transverse Laplacian to combine the derivative of x and y into a single term. And then you have the transverse Laplacian of the envelope, of the slowly varying envelope, minus 2j, the derivative of a with respect to z is equal to zero. And here we have it. This is the paraxial wave equation that we get after applying the slowly varying envelope approximation to the Helmholtz equation. What are the solutions to this particular equation? Well, one very famous solution is the, uh, the so-called Gaussian beam, which looks like, like this, roughly. And if you want to know mathematically what the description is of this Gaussian beam, then just look in the course notes, and there you have the formulas in all its, uh, its full glory of this Gaussian beam.